invite your attention to the book of Daniel, chapter 3, as we continue to follow some of the themes that were part of our Vacation Bible School week before last. We plan to spend really just one more week um, in the book of Daniel. Uh, there's plenty more there to study, but uh, maybe we'll do that another time. But this morning, Daniel chapter 3, if you have a Bible handy, uh, I'm going to read that chapter for us as we begin this morning. Uh, you're welcome to follow along. Uh, if not, then listen carefully. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officers, officials, excuse me, to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted, people of all races, nations, and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. The Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage he commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up, threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men, unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed. And the fourth looks like a god. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. 
Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their, on their heads was singed and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no god who can rescue like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. An amazing story. The king goes from what God can save you from my power to there is no God who can rescue like this. So I was reflecting on this story, um, a song from years ago came to memory and I looked it up, uh, Statler Brothers song. Any of you know what one I'm talking about? Johnny Cash actually sang it a few times, called The Fourth Man in the Fire. Okay, I guess your roots don't go as deep in Southern Gospel as mine do, huh? <laughs> Look it up, I'm not going to sing it this morning. I thought about it, but it would have taken a quartet, and we couldn't quite get that together. Um, the chorus, and there's all this echo parts and, and so forth, they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't burn. A fun song. But as I gave up, you know, okay, we don't really have time and people to put that together. Um, uh, actually, our family was watching a movie last evening, and another song came to mind, and I was almost serious about, ah, oh, that would be perfect. And I was picturing, if only I could get this image on the screen of these three men walking out. I mean, they, it, it's actually a thing, you know. You, you look it up. It's, it's like explosion walk away. And there are all these different movie scenes and so forth and people with this explosion behind them and these people just walking out <laughs> completely unharmed. And I thought, if only I could get a picture like that of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking out of that furnace and then bring up the music to the boys are back in town. <laughs> I thought I would just give you that image this morning, use your imagination of what that would look and sound like. Um, but you know, as amazing as this story is, and as fun as that is to even think about this, this triumphant walking out of that furnace and God showing himself mightier than the king of Babylon could ever have imagined. As amazing as that is, our focus this morning is not primarily to celebrate God's miraculous deliverance of, yeah, we know their Babylonian names. I'm going to honor their faith in the living God and remind us of their birth names. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Yes, the story is a powerful reminder that God is able to do the seemingly impossible. It's a reminder that God is present with us in the midst of Babylon. God is present wherever we are and whatever we are facing. He is able to deliver. However, our primary focus this morning, is on God's presence with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in the days and hours earlier as they faced the temptation brought about by the king's edict. Our focus this morning is on how we too can live faithfully in the face of temptation in the midst of whatever Babylon we might find ourselves. So let's take just a moment and review the story. It is probably not a coincidence that the king decides to make a statue. 
Daniel chapter 2 that we looked at last week talks about this troubling dream that the king had. And, and Daniel, with his friends praying and, and alongside of him, was able to, to courageously intervene and received God's revelation and wisdom to be able to tell the king not only what it meant, but to tell him the dream, which he was demanding of all of his wise advisors, and then tell him the meaning. And in that dream, there was this statue. And remember, the statue had a head of gold, and then, and then the next part of the king was silver, and then bronze, and then, and then iron. And the interpretation talked about different kingdoms. And, and Daniel said to him, by revelation of God, you, O king, are the head of gold. But after you will come another kingdom inferior to yours. And then after that, another, another, and went on to talk about things that were to come. And ultimately, there was going to be this large rock cut out from a mountain, but not with human hands, that would roll and crush the statue, and that represented the kingdom of God that would have no end. Ironic, isn't it, that the very next chapter, King Nebuchadnezzar orders this statue, this image, to be built. Maybe it looked a little bit like him. Interesting that he made not a replica of his dream. He's going to make the whole thing out of gold. Maybe if the whole thing's out of gold, then this, this prophecy won't come true. That was only a dream. This is an image. Make the whole thing gold. That's my kingdom. It's never going to end. Nobody's going to conquer us. Well, but that's not really our focus this morning either. It's not so much what's going on in Nebuchadnezzar as what's going on in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, the issue is that the king signed this law requiring everyone in the kingdom to bow down to this statue whenever the royal music was played. If anyone refused, they would be cast into a furnace, probably a furnace used for melting metals such as iron and gold. And that was a problem for the Hebrew worshipers of the living God. It was a direct violation of the first two commandments. Do not worship any God except me. Do not make idols that look like anything in the sky or on earth or in the oceans under the earth. Don't bow down and worship idols. I am the Lord your God. I demand all your love. Not only was it a violation of the first two commandments, it was a violation of numerous other reminders from Moses and the prophets in the years that followed. What was a worshiper of the living God to do? In the face of such an edict, in the face of such dire consequences. What is a worshiper of the living God to do today? You say, oh well, fortunately we don't have many idols around here. You know, maybe not the kind made out of metal that there's stood up on a platform. You and I both know that we live in a culture as dedicated to idolatry as Babylon. And you and I both know that there are just as many temptations for us to elevate any number of things in the first place above God. There may be prices to pay if we don't go along with the flow. Maybe not quite as dire as what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced, but Something keeps pushing us, making us feel like we've got to chase those same things. We've got to devote our lives to God's little g. To honor, worship, give ourselves to other idols. 
What is a worshiper of the living God to do when faced with these temptations? Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said no. And from their story, along with other scriptures, I want to suggest four principles that perhaps can help us live faithfully in the face of our temptations. Not necessarily in an order of one leading to the other, but four principles. The first one is that faithfulness in big things starts with faithfulness in small things. How do you say no to the king when when you're facing death as a consequence? Maybe you're able to do that when you've also said no to the king about little things like food. You remember that? That was only two weeks ago. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel, as a captive, brought into Babylon as probably a teenager with other young, strong, intelligent men from from Judah, brought into this foreign country almost 1,700 miles away and immersed in their culture, trained in their languages and their customs and indoctrinated to serve the king. And Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself by eating the king's food. And he and his friends appealed to those who were over them, and they were allowed for a period of time, 10 days, to test by eating what God had prescribed. And at the end of those 10 days, they were stronger and healthier, and they were allowed to continue that diet indefinitely. Such a small thing. God doesn't really care about little things like that, does he? But there's a principle that faithfulness in big things starts with faithfulness in small things. Larry Osborne, the teacher of the video series that we're watching in the library class about some of these same themes, this morning's session was talking about how, how the key, it, it, it began with obedience, simple obedience, and how obedience, he's talking about from his perspective, he offered five different things that, that were important, but he said they kind of build on each other, and, and how as we, we obey God, not just the things that make sense, but even things that don't seem to make sense, and, and then over time we gain perspective, and then we gain endurance, and then confidence, and then courage. Again, the, the point where it overlaps here is that it, it, it's a journey and it starts with little decisions sometimes that puts us in a position then to have perspective, to have endurance, which is obedience over time consistently, and to gain confidence in who God is. And I wish I could remember the way he stated it, that, uh, that basically confidence leads us then to have the courage that they showed. It seems like their spirit, their attitude is much like what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, where according to the message paraphrase, if you will, that we read this morning, Paul wrote to them, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice That the plan of God for you is good. It meets all his demands and moves toward the goal of true maturity. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That was their commitment in things little and big. First principle, faithfulness in big things starts with faithfulness in small things. Secondly, faithfulness in the face of temptation is built on the confidence that God is able to deliver us from from or through whatever it is we fear, whatever it is that gives the temptation its power. You know, there's always some fear attached to temptation. 
at some level. Fear of missing out. Fear of having to feel pain. Fear that something won't work out unless I do this. Fear that I'll not be happy. I mean, all kinds of fears that drive the power of temptation in our lives. But faithfulness in the face of temptation is built on the confidence that God is able. And I've shared this dozens of times over the years. One of my favorite stories, one of my favorite examples of faith is this story here this morning. To be able to stand before the king in the face of death and to say, King, we know, we know that our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're going to do what's right. Even if he doesn't. And you've heard me talk about that a lot. And I hope for all of us it's more than just words, it's more than just a story, that 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 becomes the anchor of our lives. That God is able, and that's enough. If for some reason he chooses not to come through, not to deliver us from the trial, from this consequence, from whatever it is, that he will deliver us through it. Faithfulness in the face of temptation is built on the confidence that God is able to deliver us from or through whatever it is we might fear. Third principle. When facing a temptation, there is always a way of escape. Well, what do we mean by escape? I don't mean escaping the furnace. I mean escaping giving in, escaping succumbing to the temptation. Bob read that uh, earlier this morning, the, the scripture from 1 Corinthians 10. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. I think the problem is that so often we don't look for that way. So often we don't really want that way. When we're faced with something, we, what, what different would, difference would it make? And I don't know what it is that, that you would identify this morning that comes to your mind when we talk about temptation in our lives. But how often... When facing a temptation, do we stop and say, God, show me the way out? Maybe it's one of those cases where we we have not because we ask not. But if God, if we would stop and say, I I, I really want, (laughs) I really want a way out and ask God, I believe God would show us. The last principle this morning. Temptation loses its power when we love God more than we love anything that this world has to offer us. You say, wow, yeah, how do you, how do you get there? Well, it's a journey. But it is certainly a consistent message of Scripture. From the Ten Commandments, no gods before me, really means no gods besides me. It doesn't just mean you can have gods, just make sure that they're second, third. Well, no, no other gods, no other idols. Jesus said in Matthew 6, as we read earlier, you can't serve two masters. By loving one, you, you can't help but coming to hate the other in some way. You, you give yourself to the one and you develop contempt for the other. You, you really can't. You can't give yourself and move towards one without it compromising your loyalty to the other. Interesting that Jesus concluded that by saying you can't serve God and money. (laughs) He named one of the idols that we struggle with. 
He says you can't do it. They can't both be God. There's this fascinating passage in the book of Revelation. And I want to share and then share a story. If I've shared this before, it's been a lot of years ago. Revelation chapter 12. There's a lot in Revelation we don't understand, but I think we can, I think we can understand the point that I'm trying to share this morning. The Apostle John writes, Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, It has come at last, salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. Understand, Jesus is not the accuser. Jesus is the deliverer. Jesus is the redeemer. Satan is the accuser. Satan's the one who wants to keep us pinned to our failures, to our sins. Jesus wants to cleanse us from all of that, to release us, to, to break the chains through his amazing grace. No, the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down. And then this next verse says, and they, speaking of our brothers and sisters, and they have defeated him, speaking of Satan. Three things, says, by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony. The third statement's where I want to focus. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. That's how they defeated. That's how they gained victory over Satan. In his efforts to destroy them, they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Tony Campolo gives an illustration about this. Some of you know that name, some don't. Used to teach down at Eastern University. Speaker traveled the world. Very entertaining. Very poignant. He talks about one day in the middle of a lecture, a student stood up, said, oh, that's a bunch of baloney, and headed for the door. Well, he stopped in the middle of his lecture and said, young man, if you leave this room, if you leave this class, you're... I'm not going to ever let you back in again. You know what the kid's response was? <laughs> Who cares? He says, well, if you, if you leave this class and you're not coming back in again, you'll fail this class. It says, Who cares? Well, if you fail this class, you're not going to graduate. Who cares? Tony was ran, running out of ammunition. Well, if you never graduate, you'll never get a good job, and you'll never be able to afford all the things that you want in life. Who cares? At that point, Tony says, I realized that as long as that student cared nothing about anything I had to offer him, I had no power even to make him return to his seat. If he truly didn't care about anything that I could offer him. What could this world really offer us? What can Babylon really offer us? What can the king offer us? These heroes of faith and revelation, they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Our sisters and brothers in Nigeria, in other places of the world, loved not their lives so much that they were afraid to die. If you don't bow down, I'm going to throw you in the furnace. Who cares? I've got a hope that's bigger than that. I've got a God that's bigger than that. I love him more than I love life itself. That gives us great power. To be able to be faithful in the midst of temptation. God will make a way. 
where there seems to be no way. May he help us to be faithful to him. 